Turn with me in your Bibles then to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the first epistle of Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, reading from the New King James Version, the New Authorized Version, God's Holy Word. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is your word. It is relevant for our day. We have an adversary to our Christian walk who is ever active and wants to destroy us. May we be sobered by the truths of these two verses. Convict our hearts of these truths. Apply them to our minds, our hearts, and our will. And may we ever knowledge, acknowledge our total dependence on you in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You remember the commercial, is it true or is it Memorex? Is it real or is it Memorex? I remember watching that commercial many times on TV. We can say the same to the devil. Is he real or is he unreal? Just as 71% of the people believe they are going to heaven, only 4% believe they are going to hell. Just as over 90% of the people in America believe in God, there's less than 50% believe that the devil is real. I remember growing up watching cartoons, whether it was um, Betty Boop or whether it was Daffy Duck or uh, Bugs Bunny or whatever. I can remember the crisis would come for this cartoon figure and in the middle of it all, you remember it, well, there would be that choice. Do you choose for evil or for good? And there's the good angel standing there with the halo all in white on the one shoulder. And then there's this kind of comic figure on the other shoulder. You know, supposedly that devil figure, dressed in that little orange fiery jumpsuit, you know, with that pitchfork and the, and the flame above the head, you know, and that goatee sticking down. And you know, you remember that look. And what's the problem with all of that? The problem with all of that, you see, is that we can take that and it's just, oh, the devil's just a comic figure. He's not really real. And parents and raising children need to be aware of that. And they need to help their children discern between what is the real and the unreal. We are in a culture today when it comes to movies and all of that and this virtual reality that's going on. There's so much confusion between what is real and not real. During the Vietnam War, there was a group of army recruits that was learning about weapons. And as they handled their new M16 rifles while sitting in the safety of the classroom, the recruits weren't taking the instructions very seriously. And suddenly the drill sergeant slammed his fist on the table and he shouted, Gentlemen, I've survived a tour of duty in Vietnam and knowing how to use my weapon was one, one reason why I survived and I'm standing here today alive before you. Now it's your turn. And the startled recruits then began paying attention to what the sergeant was demonstrating. Friends, when facing the enemy, there's nothing like having someone who can stand up and say to you and I, hey, I've been there. I've done that. I've gone through that. Let me tell you how to defeat the enemy. And that's what Peter was doing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he wrote this epistle to the persecuted saints in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia there, in chapter 1, verse 1. They were living in a literal battlefield of the devil. And to survive that, they needed the encouragement of God's word and the witness of a tested battle-scarred saint like Peter, the apostle. Peter knew the strategies of Satan. Peter was not ignorant of his devices, and he desired the same for his sorely tried readers. Matthew 10, 16. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. And 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant 
of his devices. We need to read the inspired words of Peter against the backdrop of what happened to him in his walk with Christ. You remember those arrogant statements he made in Luke 22, 33, where he says to Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And then in Matthew 26, 33, Peter answered and said to Jesus, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And then we think of his subsequent threefold denial of Jesus in Luke 22, 54 to 62. And after that third denial, how he went out and he wept bitterly. In Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders and be uh, killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this will not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. What had happened to Peter is that he was set to work by Satan. He was oppressed by Satan at this time. He was a pawn in Satan's hand. Therefore, Christ calls him by the name of Satan. And you and I believe that true, true believers in Christ, as Savior and Lord Christ is on the throne, that we cannot be demon-possessed, but we can be demon-oppressed or oppressed by Satan. Isaac Ambrose, who died in 1664, a Puritan, has a book called The Christian Warrior. And if you get a copy of that book, it's an excellent book. I have given it to each of my three children, and they have read it through. And it is a book that deals with the Christian warrior in combat against Satan and his demons. It's an excellent book. Ambrose says in there, those wicked men who propose carnal comforts as a cure for spiritual wounds are instruments in the hands of Satan. And that's what Peter was when he stood and faced Jesus and said, be it far from you, Lord. Friends, persecutions, trials, and afflictions, they're among the chief weapons that Satan uses to break down Christians. And this is what was happening to those readers, those Christians that Peter was writing to in that Greco-Roman world in the middle of the first century when Nero was the emperor. And remember, he reigned from 54 to 68 AD. So Peter informed his readers, and he tells us also how to be victorious in spiritual warfare against Satan that's all around us continually. Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And my prayer is that I will not have to pound on the pulpit today to get your attention that the Holy Spirit will convict us of the seriousness of this topic, that Satan works relentlessly to destroy our faith, our bodies, and our souls. And the question for you and I this morning is, are we fighting the good fight against Satan and his minions? Should we fear Satan? The first point this morning is our adversary. Our adversary. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. In the closing part of his epistle that he's in here, you and I have repeatedly referred to Peter's exhortations. They began in 4, 7 through 19. Remember, we went through the 10 exhortations there. And that's the therefore that's there. But the end of all things at hand, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. 1 Peter 4, 7. There's another therefore in 4.19, and there's a therefore in 5.6. The therefore, it's a call for people to make application. The therefores in Scripture represent sanctification. What Peter is doing, he's warning his readers. This is a call here to obedience. Otherwise, there will be judgment. There's comfort, there's counsel here, yes. But there's a call here to bind the conscience and bring about a change in behavior. And in it's all in light of the doctrine of imminence. Christ's soon return, the rapture. In 4-7, 
The end of all things is at hand. Christ can come back at any moment. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, since he may come back at any time, we need to be ready at any time. And William Barclay said the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is never to forget the presence of Christ. You'll notice here that verse 8 begins with two imperatives. Be sober and be vigilant. Two imperatives. We've reiterated many times here in our study in 1 Peter that indicatives are the basis for the imperatives. The indicative, what God has already done for us. 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be their God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy caused us to be born again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready revealed in the last times. That's the indicatives, what Christ has already done for us. So in light of the indicatives, they are the basis for the imperatives, the commands of God. How then should we live? The doctrine of concurrence is at work here. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility both flow together. And God works in and through everything that goes on in the universe, including human actions without coercion, to bring his decrees to pass. God is sovereign over the means as well as the ends. Our salvation is incumbent upon his working and also us working. The doctrine of concurrence. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to do his will and his pleasure. Let go and let God, friends, is not biblical. It negates the imperatives. It negates the therefores of scripture. A non-working passive saint is not a saint of God. The first imperative is be sober, be sober. We've run across this in chapter 4, verse 7. The King James Version says, the end of all things is at hand. Be sober. There. Be sober, be vigilant. In chapter 1, verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be sober means be self-controlled. Be self-controlled. Literally, do not become intoxicated. Do not become intoxicated so that you lose control in thought and action. Metaphorically, being sober means not to lose spiritual control. Not to lose spiritual control by imbibing the world system. We can use it, yes, but don't love it. Don't become a part of it. Don't conform to it. The definition of world in, in John's writings, the world is an ethical term that it refers to anything or anybody apart from and in opposition to God. 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world is not the love of the Father. The love of the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but not things of God the Father. Set your priorities. Be in charge. That first imperative is closely allied with the second. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be vigilant means be watchful. Be watchful. I think of William Wilberforce, who was the abolitionist in England who died in 1833. And you remember how he persevered in political justice and he fought with relentless vigilance. Here's what Wilberforce said. The Christian's watch must this, thus during life now know no termination because the enemy will ever be at hand. So it must be the more close and vigilant because he's nowhere free from danger but is on every side open to attack. Matthew 24, 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the hour that the Lord is coming. Watch, therefore. Be alert. Be alert. Both of these imperatives, be sober and be vigilant or be watchful, they're both used in that eschatological context of the last times of the imminent rapture of Jesus Christ in 4-7. The end of all things is at hand. Why is it so important to heed the, the imperatives? Because, as Peter says here in verse 8, we have an enemy. We have an enemy, and, I, and he identifies that enemy here as the devil. Now, the name Satan means adversary. Devil here is diabolos. 
and that means slander or accuser. In Revelation 12, in verse 9, that Satan is called then the slanderer, devil, accuser, that old serpent, referring back to Genesis 3, back in the garden. The serpent shows up, it's that great dragon, it's the devil, it's the Satan. He's the accuser, the slanderer, the adversary that we have. In Job 1.6, it says, There was a day when the sons of God came together, and Satan came also among them. Derek Thomas, who has written his uh, dissertation, his Ph.D. dissertation on the book of Job, on that verse says, Where does this take place? And he says, We plead ignorance. It can't be the third heaven where God resides. Why? Because, he says, no sin or evil can step across the threshold of the holy place. Question arises, who is Satan? Well, we know from Scripture, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, he is a fallen angel. Thus, he's a created being. Martin Luther said very interestingly this, the devil is God's devil. Have you ever heard that before? The devil is God's devil. Thus, as a created being, Satan is not autonomous. He is not sovereign. He's not omniscient, and he's not omnipotent. He is not as creator God. So in Job 1.6, when there was a day when the sons of God came before God to present themselves before God, and Satan came also among them, you and I ask ourselves, well, what is he doing there coming before God? What he's doing there coming before God, friends, is Satan has to give an account before God of what he is doing. In Job 1, 8 through 12 and 2, 4 through 6, you remember that confrontation that was initiated by God. And he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him in the whole earth? He's blameless and he's upright before the law of God. And Satan said, first of all, oh, he just follows you because you put a hedge around him. You protect him and all that. So God said, okay, you go ahead and you touch all that he has. And we know in the first chapter he did. He destroyed basically everything that Job owned, including the house that seven of Job's sons were in and three of his daughters. That house collapsed and they were all killed in one day. And God told Satan, you go ahead, touch all that he has, but don't touch his person. And then in chapter 2, 4 through 6, Satan comes, God initiates it again. Have you considered my servant Job? Because Job did not sin against God. And Satan says, oh, skin for skin. He just follows you because you're protecting his body. God says, go ahead. Touch his body, but spare his person. Spare his person. You see there, God is putting a bounding permission on Satan. Satan is a creature. God is the creator. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should be perceived by them. The God of this world, Satan, is only the God of this world by bounding permission from God. The hymn writer had it right, and I've recited it many times before you. This is my Father's world, oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong is oft so strong, God is the ruler. Yet this is my Father's world, why should my heart be sad? The Lord, the hev- the Lord reigns, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. We need to consider three things on Satan, his constitution, his considerable knowledge, his chameleon character. His constitution, he is a supernatural being. Yes, he's a created being, but remember, he is a supernatural being. You remember in Jude verse 9, when Michael the archangel was contending with the devil about the body of of Moses, that he dared not bring a railing accusation against him, but he said, the Lord rebuked thee. Even Michael the archangel is not an equal of power to Satan. Only God himself is above Satan in power. There's a hierarchy of angels. You think of Daniel chapter 10. Daniel prayed and it took three weeks to get the answer through and the holy angel was coming with the answer. Why? Because he was detained by the angel of Persia and Greek. Unholy angels that are over nations. And it took Michael the archangel to go and free up that holy angel so he could come and give Daniel the answer. Three week delay. But the answer came. A hierarchy of angels. Daniel chapter 10. 
We are mere temporal beings. There's an old Arab saying that says, when elephants fight, the ants get trampled. It's a poor analogy. But you and I going against, Satan is like an ant going against an elephant. It is no contest. His considerable knowledge. I encourage you to read C.S. Lewis' screw tape letters. And you'll get insights there into the knowledge that Satan has of us as human beings and what the demons have of us as human beings. His considerable knowledge. He's not omniscient. And yet, you see, he has thousands of years to go by in which he has observed human behavior, sinful behavior, what he can do to cause people to fall and destroy their faith. And he knows all the different personality types whether you're choleric, whether you're melancholy, or whatever you happen to be a personality, he knows your raw material. And he knows just where to tweak us, you see, to make us fall. His chameleon character. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. So can all his minions disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Friends, with this biblical knowledge of the devil art and what we now know of the devil, we should tremble. We should tremble. We need to heed Peter's warnings. We need to be sober and alert, lest... Satan's devices have success against us and he takes advantage of us. Or, more precisely, I should say, his demons. Because there's only one Satan. And it's a little bit presumptuous of little old you and little old me to say that Satan himself would come against us. But it more likely is that Satan's demons, an unclean spirit, would come against us. And there again, read C.S. Lewis' screw tape letters and you'll have understanding of that. Also remember this. Satan's and his demons are outside the purvey of salvation. In Hebrews 2.16, he did not, Jesus did not take on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And then in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says there's one God, one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. There is no salvation for Satan or, the, or his demons, the unclean spirits, so don't pray for their salvation. And also remember that Satan is not bound now. It is amazing to me how many people, especially of, re of Reformed persuasion, that believe that Satan is bound at this present time. And they take that from Luke 10, 18, you know, where Jesus said after he sent out the 72, and that they cast out demons that Jesus said he saw Satan as it were fall from heaven as lightning. All that meant there is that Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is sovereign over Satan. You read farther in the chapter there, Satan is the strong man in his, his palace. He has his armor on. And when he has his palace on and guards his palace, all his goods are safe. But when a stronger than him comes and takes away his armor there and he pillages all of his spoil, that, that stronger one is Jesus Christ, the omnipotent God himself. There is a binding of Satan that's coming. And that, of course, we know from Revelation 20 during the millennium. At the beginning of the millennium, it says right there that he is bound for the thousand years. And that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed. And then he gets his armies, his unholy angels, and all those sinners. During that thousand years, they form that one last army against God, Christ, and the faithful. Before he's defeated them and thrown into a lake of fire and brimstone. That, then, will be the everlasting a binding of Satan. Should we fear Satan? First point, he's our adversary. The second is his mission. His mission. Look at the end of verse 8 there. His mission. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now that walks about, there's present active tense. Continual. There's no binding of Satan. He is active right now in this world of ours against the human race. The recipients of this letter, they had already been exposed to the attacks of the devil, the slander. You read that in chapter 4, verse 4, 14, many places in the first epistle. And now they would experience him as an adversary. Peter says, as a roaring lion. A roaring lion. 
Did you know that a mature male lion called the king of the beasts? By the way, Nance and I were at, uh, uh, saw a zoo lately, and the king of the beasts there was anything but the king of the beasts. I mean, this one probably stood about three feet tall, weighed a couple hundred pounds, and when he roared, it didn't exactly put fear in anyone. But when you're counting the king of the beasts, they can be as long as eight feet, four feet high at the shoulder, in other words, stand up on us quite a ways. They can weigh up to 600 pounds. And I find it very interesting that lions live in family units, you're not going to believe this, called prides. Called prides. And they may have anywhere from four to 37 members. And the females do most of the hunting. And they hunt when? At night. At night. And they pursue their prey and they achieve speeds up to 35 miles an hour. And when the king of the beast roars, you can hear it as far away as six miles. When Satan roars, what is he doing? He does it to induce fear in you and I. Remember, faith is the anchor of the soul. Fear is the panic of the soul. He does that to put fear into you and I so that he will paralyze us as believers. And we do not then obey Jesus Christ and oppose Satan. He wants to intimidate us to the point of denying our faith and denying our Lord. Remember how Satan came against Jesus there in the desert, in the wilderness, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. How he opposed Jesus. And Jesus had to be to go against Satan, so too you and I. Richard Baxter, him, Christ leads me through no darker rooms than he went through before. He that into God's kingdom comes must enter through this door. We've cited many times in 1 Peter the biblical principle, suffering is the pathway to glory. In chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, the theme verses in chapter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while need be, you are grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, though it be tested with fire, it's more precious than gold which is perishable, though it be tested with fire, may be found to result in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If believers deny their faith, Satan has devoured them, and he has brought them back into his fold. And what does that signify? That signifies that they were only professing believers in the beginning and not true possessing believers. Why? Because Jesus says in John 10, 28 and 29, the Lion of Judah says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone take them out of my hand. But my Father, which is greater than all, and no man shall take him out of his hand. And also Philippians 1.6, Jesus says, that which God begins, he completes. You think of history in the 5th century AD in northern Africa, in Augustine's time, there was what was called the lapsi. There was the Donatist, the false teaching that was just like leaven permeating the professing church at the time. And then the, the pagan hordes came through northern Africa so instead of enduring persecution, what did a lot of the professors do? They lapsed in their faith. They denied their faith so they wouldn't be persecuted. You think in the first century, the Romans, in the Greco-Roman world with their pantheon of gods, and once a year, every person in Rome had to go before the authorities, and there was the sacrifice where they burned the incense to their pantheon of gods, and to Caesar as God, you had to bow your knee before that incense that was being bur burned and that altar, and then uh, profess your allegiance to Caesar and to the gods of Rome, and then you had to sign a certificate with your name, and then you were an accepted participant in the Roman Empire for that year. You could get your jobs, you could be in the social guilds, etc. And if you didn't, and of course the Christians didn't, they said, Christ is Lord, you'd end up being fed to the lions at the Colosseum. You'll notice what's happening in the Islamic countries today. Wayne has shared this many times with us in these restricted and hostile countries, is what does through force. They want to put fear in Christians to stifle their ministry, keep them behind closed doors, and also the forced conversions of Christians to Islam. And they use, they're being used by Satan there and his, as their roaring, his roaring lion. You'll notice the end of the verse there says devour. Devour there in the Greek means to drink down or to gulp down. 
to drink down or gulp down. And what that pictures for you and I is the viciousness of his attacks. The viciousness of his attacks. He's not out to wound. His final objective is to destroy. So Peter's not thinking of some lion in a zoo, friends, but rather he's thinking, thinking of starved lions in the Roman Colosseum that would rip the Christians apart from limb to limb for the entertainment of the Roman masses. If you've ever seen the movie Gladiator and you've seen the lions that come up there, you'll, you'll know what I mean and what Peter no doubt had in mind. Satan's ob 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 opposition to us, interesting enough, is many times, is when does he do, do his feeding? It's just like the natural line, is at night. And he goes out by stealth. And he uses human beings as his means to his ends. Remember in 1 Corinthians 10.20, Paul said there, the Corinthian believers, what the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to the demons. The demons were at work, but they were using, you see, their unbelieving minions. They use stealth. Psalm 11, 1 and 2. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mouth? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the godly, from the shadows. From the shadows. When he roars, he seeks whom he may devour. And you and I, when the lion roars, he roars, he has his prey in his grasp. And you and I need to heed the exhortation here. In verse 9, or we'll hear Satan's devouring roar. Should we, hear, should we fear Satan? The first point is our adversary. Second point is his mission. The third point is our mandate in verse 9. Mandate. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. There's three clauses here. And they continue Peter's exhortation, exhortation to stand against the devil. The first clause is resist. Now this is the same form that we'll come across in our study Sunday night in James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that order is very important. It means to withstand, to take an active stand against the foe. Again, friends, there's no passivity here. There's no let go and let God. Acts 13, 10. It's used of Elimus, the sorcerer, in his resistance to the gospel. 2 Timothy 3.8, Janus and Jambres, their resistance to Moses. 2 Timothy 4.15, Alexander the coppersmith and his resistance to Paul. In Galatians 2.11, it's used where Paul says, I withstood Peter to the face when Peter was taking a stand with the Judaizers. William Grimshaw, who died in 1763, probably from the plague in England, from typhus. He worked with... Uh, John Wesley. As a pastor, he said this. His conviction was that failure to seek to win others to Christ has disastrous, disastrous consequences. We take the devil's part in destroying souls. Our connivance at the ways of the wicked is tacit approbation of Satan's destruction of them. If we are silent, we consent. If we are not against him, we are for him. If we oppose him, not we assist him. And non-resistance of the devil, in this case, is doing half his work for him. Oh, shocking. The second clause says, be steadfast in the faith. In other words, be firm in your faith. The word is scleros. It means be firm, be solid. How? By being fixed on the faith. There's a definite article. It's the body of truth. The revelation of God. It's Jude verse 3. You earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Since Satan is a liar, in John 8, 44, he's a deceiver in Revelation 27, verse 8, the only way to stand against him is to know God's word and to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, isn't it interesting? When Jesus is confronted by Satan, three temptations, what does Jesus do? He answers with what? He quotes the Word of God. How important is Scripture memory? The soldier's sword. Do we faithfully memorize God's Word? Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And we could add, you also resist the devil by God's Word. It's the sword of the Spirit, as it says in Ephesians 6, 
17. Be Berean Christians, Acts 17, 11. Know the scriptures, whether those things are so. Be discerning, Hebrews 5, 14. You judge between evil and the good. Have godly wisdom. And Proverbs 2, 6, it's God who gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. James 1, 5 says, if you lack wisdom, you let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and abradeth not. Psalm 119, 104 and 5, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, that we should no longer be children tossed through and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Friends, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God we shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. The third clause, the end of verse 9. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Here's an encouragement from Peter. An encouragement for Peter. Your persecution, friends, is not unique. Rather, it's common to the saints throughout the Greco-Roman world. And that's the meaning of cosmos here. Referring to the entire Greco-Roman world. Remember, ruled by the emperor Caesar, uh, Nero. And Nero, remember, was the one who blamed the burning of Rome on Christians. And what did he do? He put the Christians in gunny sacks, sackcloth and that, dipped in oil, impaled them up on stakes, and then lit them to be the lights of Rome at night. Your persecution is not unique. It's common to the saints. He reiterates here, reiterates 1 Peter 4.12, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to come upon you as though some strange thing happened on you. Persecution of God's people, friends, it comes with the territory. It's a mark of Christians. John 15, 18 through 20, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember what I said to you. The servant is not above the master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Remember Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. They went to Vanity Fair, Christian faithful. And they were persecuted there. Why? Because their clothes were different. Their speech was different. They didn't buy the world's goods. So they were encaged. And hate good and all those other unbelievers raging as Satan's roaring lions against them. They killed faithful. And then Christian was able to escape. In 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, drunkenness, revelings, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Because of then, of not being conformed to the world, the writers that Peter was writing to there were persecuted for their faith. They were social outcasts. They were spiritual exiles. So the question arises, how about us? Are we experiencing any opposition from the world? Do, the, does the world even know that we are Christian? Remember Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And in the Greek, that means both in life and in lip. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men by your silence, then I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Should we fear Satan? We've looked at three points this morning. Our adversary, his mission, and our mandate. As Christians, we've said, we are involved in spiritual warfare. It begins the moment that you and I are born again. We engage Satan. Ephesians 6.12 We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Peter's exhorting you and I here to resist the devil. We need to respect him. We need to recognize him and resist him. We need to respect him. So be sober. Don't joke about him. Don't ignore him. Don't underestimate his ability. 
Remember, he's a supernatural being. You recognize the devil. He's a great cunning pretender. Remember how Paul warned the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And remember 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, he's able, that chameleon character, he can transform himself into an angel of light. And we need to acknowledge that 1 Corinthians 10, 20, that the things the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. Remember, when we incur opposition from the ungodly, who's behind that is the demons and ultimately Satan. We need to resist the devil. We need to put on that whole armor of God. I think of James 4, 7 again. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he from, we will flee from you. That's the truth. That's the truth. The order there is important. Submit to God, then resist the devil. And remember the truth of that verse is found in Luke 4, 13. The truth of James 4, 7 is found in Luke 4, 13. What did Satan do after he exhausted those temptations against Jesus? It says that he went away for a season until an opportune time. You and I can have victory over Satan, but let us ever be mindful it will be just for that moment, for that time. Satan will be back. He will be back. He walks about, continual, non-ending, 24-7. Revelation 12.10 says he accuses them before the brethren. How often? Day and night. Day and night. At all times. In verse 11, we need to be mindful. It says, they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Remember, the only offensive weapons we have in our armor against Satan is the word of God and prayer. In Ephesians 6, 10-18. And the first weapon is the buckler, and that was for the Roman soldier, the buckler of truth. Truth. It holds everything together. You and I need to know the truth. We need to know the truth of the Word of God, use that as our sword in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, and pray, depending on God, for deliverance. Submitting to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Before we can stand against Satan, we must bow before God. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear not those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in him. Don't fear Satan. We fear God. We fear God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9.10. When John Calvin looked at Matthew 10.28, he said it made his hair stand on end. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He must prevail, he cannot fail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Frank Borum in his life verses shares this about Martin Luther. On one occasion, Martin Luther, in one of his periods of depression at the Wartburg Castle, it seemed to him that he saw a hideous and malignant form inscribing the record of his own transgressions around the walls of the room in which he was staying. There seemed to be no end to the list. Sins of thought, sins of commission, secret sins, open sins. And the pitiless scribe wrote on and on without corruption or pause. And while the accuser with us was thus occupied, Luther bowed his head and prayed. And when he looked up, the writer had paused, was turned and facing him. You have forgotten one thing, said Luther, and that? asked his tormentor. Luther continued, take your pen once more and write across it all, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And at the utterance of those words, the spirit vanished and the walls were all clean. You see, friends, it was subsequent to that that Martin Luther wrote the words that we sang. And listen to them closely. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. But still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. 
Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Thus ask who that might be, Christ Jesus it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled shall threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not at him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gift are ours, through him who with us sideth. Slideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you for your word of truth. We are sobered by the truths of these verses. We indeed have an adversary who never relents. While we are on this earth, he continually desires to thwart us to oppose us, to destroy our faith. He's ever present beside us, behind us, around us, in his minions. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would always advance on bended knee before you, knowing that you are the omnipotent one, that what you've begun in us in Christ, that you will complete, that no one, not even Satan himself, can take us out of your hand. What you've begun, you will complete. And may we always be mindful that we will have victory in Christ. Ultimate victory, yes. Victory even now. That if we submit to you, Satan will flee. But let us also be mindful that the truth of James 4.7 is found in Luke 4.13. That Satan will leave only for a season, only for an opportune time. May we ever be sober, May we ever be vigilant. 